So many years ago, before, way before we even started doing keto, um, I used to make biltong all the time at home. And about five years ago, we moved to this place and everything got packed up and the setup wasn't the same and I just I just got out of the habit of it. But um, last week, I finally lived up to my promises of starting to do this again and um, I made the first batch. And I posted a few pictures of the sort of the progression of it uh, on Twitter and Facebook and got a huge response from people asking how it was done and what's the recipe. And I could have just given people kind of the instructions of the recipe of what I did that time. But the truth of it is that there are so many ways to do it and so, so many options and it's, it gets very personalized. And so all the videos that I've ever watched trying to learn how to make this back in the day, never focus on their recipe. Um, and very few kind of made people understand that they could adjust things and change things and make it more to their liking or more to their taste if, if uh, they would maybe something in that particular recipe that they didn't like or prefer not to eat. Um, so I decided to do this to try and show people the process, how I make it and the options and the very varieties that, that I put into making it for ourselves. Um, and then even go beyond that and talk about some of the other options that I don't even do, but I know about, um, but may appeal to, to other people. So what I'm going to start with is what I started with last week when I made my first batch for five years um, was the basics, all right? And in the basics, what you need is some meat, some, in this particular case, some rock salt or what they call here ice cream salt, coriander seeds, pepper seeds, and vinegar. And we have white pepper seeds here because we, and Pam especially, is focused on trying to eliminate as many oxalates from her, our diet as possible. And black peppercorns apparently have a lot of oxalates in and white pepper doesn't. And so we're using white pepper. But if that oxalates is not a concern for you, then black peppercorns are, are just as good. And white peppercorns are just the black removed from the outside. So it's, it's so the oxalates inside. are in that black skin, basically. Yeah, so the white peppercorns are just the inside. Okay, cool. All right, so um, we'll get back to the, to the spices and that stuff a bit later. But first you need to start with the meat. So I got this from Costco and it is uh, it's called eye of round in this country I think in South Africa Europe it's called silver side um, I find this the the best cut of meat to use for a couple of different reasons first of all there's normally quite a good bit of marbling uh, within the, the structure of the of the muscle itself and for us especially now that we're on keto having a higher fat content is desirable. Um, it normally has a, a slight layer on one side of external fat, which um, as long as it's not too thick, um, I like to leave on. Back in the day before I was keto and I was scared of fat, I used to cut every little bit of fat off here um, and just live with the fat that was in inside the meat. Um, but now, I seek it out and so um, this is really good. If you really are still uh, in that group of people that have a fat phobia, or fat phobia of eating fat, then there are other cuts of um, and roasts and other cuts that you can get that um, are much leaner. So, or you could do what I did and just cut, at least cut the outside fat off. Um, one of the other reasons that I, I like this particular thing is that it's like it's like one muscle and so the grain runs consistently throughout the entire thing and in fact this is even cut in half 
think the whole muscle is probably double this. Each of these put together is probably the, the main, the, the original muscle. And, in t and along the entire length, the grain is consistent. Most other roasts that you buy are made up of a, of a couple of different muscle groups that run um, contrary to each other. So if you start slicing through the whole thing, you're going to get bits of meat with the grain going one way and bits of meat with the grain going the other way. And as you'll see, as I start to describe how this all works, the grain is very important. All right, so um, let's start with this. If uh, what I want to do is slice it so that I've got a little piece of this fat on on each slice that I'm going to hang up to dry. Um, so pretty much going to be cutting it this way, but that's quite thick. Um, so what I think I might do is, is cut one uh, slice off this way and then all the rest of the slices will be thinner. So I'm going to do that here. Um, and one of the other things you can do, especially if you if you try to cut the, the entire length, uh, if you manage to get a full length one, um, is that to make it easier to slice, it's, you can put it in the deep freeze for uh, maybe an hour, half an hour. So everything starts to firm up. It's not frozen, but it's started to firm up and it's much, much easier than to cut consistent slices through that because the more consistent you can cut your slices, the, the more evenly, the, the, if you can have an even thickness along the whole length of that slice, the more evenly it's going to cure. So, um, after with my panga, this, <laughs> this is a, um, it's actually a really good knife. It's a Victorian ox. It's like the, the blades are made by the same company that does the Swiss Army knife. And, um, it's so sharp and so dangerous, Pam makes me wrap it in a towel and hide it <laughs> uh, when we're not using it. But um, whatever you do, you need something sharp so that you can slice this well. I'm actually going to get this out of the way here so that I don't hit it when I'm trying to slice stuff. Alrighty. And what you're going to try and do, there's always going to be the end pieces in that where it doesn't work out as well as that. But what you want to try and do is cut slices about an inch thick. Um, so if I do this and I go about here, that's about an inch thick. Okay, so we we'll cut that. There we go. All right, it's maybe a little, yeah, about an inch thick, but it's, it's rounded here and that, so it's not going to be consistent. This will be a piece that we'll probably use for tasting in that as, as it's curing. Um, because it's not going to be as, as good as the rest of them. Now I can lie this piece this way. And um, again, I'm going to go a bit thinner with this one because it's, it's not flat. And so it's going to be another one of our early ones. Okay. So we've got that. You see now you've got that sliver of fat down, down the side of it. Okay. All right, now we're going to make some, some good ones here. Okay, here we go. Now you can make them even thicker than this if you want, just, you know, when you're doing, when you go back to the curing process, It'll take longer, um, and it's more important that you may have airflow over it and all of that, so you don't get uh, the stuff spoiling. But uh, that's a really nice slice. Okay, let's try another one here. Okay. One thick one and one thin one at the end for the end piece. Sure, you cut your hand fingers off. Okay. All right, so there's a thinner piece um, that will probably be cured in a day and a half, 
maybe two days, and so this will probably be one of the first pieces that we'll eat. Um, all right, so there we go. We've got three solid thick slices. This is what you're really aiming for, and a few end pieces that uh, that will cure a bit quicker. That one in the middle looks quite thick. Which one? In the middle, just because of the fat. No, that's just yeah. It's got a lip of much fat. Thicker, yeah. It's got a lip of fat. In fact, let's cut that off. But you can see there, that that is not perfect, right? It's it's a bit thicker at the top and thinner at the bottom. And you'll see later how to deal with that. Okay, so um, just go one more piece here, and then you can just fast forward uh, to the end. But you'll notice mo all, all these other pieces have a nice, like probably be quarter inch strip of fat on it. But this one has it's about a quarter inch on this side, but it's really thick on that side. Now, some people like a lot of fat, and they can. You can leave it on there like that, but you'll see that the sh as it cures, the, the meat actually shrinks, but the fat doesn't. And so you get this big wedge of fat on the side, and it, it, I, I don't, I prefer it not to have it like that. But depending on your love of fat, um, you can just leave it like that. I'm going to slice it off and, and try and make it as consistent as the others with an about a quarter inch thing of fat on it. That didn't work so well. But at least it hasn't got a big thick thing on that. Okay. I need to find something to do with this. <laughs> um, Alright, same thing here. I think I'm going to cut a couple. Of, this is really thick. So you can imagine if we're slicing this way down through it, um, the, the sli slab is going to be that, that wide, which gets a bit difficult to manage once you're trying to slice it up, once it's cured. So when I come back, we want to I'll probably cut at least two slices up from this way. pieces there. Don't let that go to waste. We'll see how to use that later. Um, We're both to a point. So yeah. We're trying to figure out. Yeah, because what happens is that if, if it goes to a point, then the, then the fat cures much quicker. And look, it's always cool because you've got a little piece to cut off the bottom while you snack it while it's curing, but. Um, to eliminate that as much as possible. So I'm going to do that. And maybe cut it like this. Okay, so these are little taster pieces as well that we can hang up near the front and get it to cure quicker. Alright, so this one needs to be fairly thin as well. Okay, now we can back to our inch or so slices. There we go, that's got some nice fat in it. Okay, so rinse and repeat. Okay. So we have all that meat sliced up nicely. I can see got a couple of thin slices here for the end pieces that will make nice stuff that cures really quickly and gives you something to taste to see how things are going. And I got this container from the container store, I think. And it works really well for me. It, it kind of, last time I made, it was the first time back for five years. So. I made about half of this in terms of, of the amount of meat. This time I'm doubled. As far as I can remember, I used to probably make 
the, another 50% of this again. And once it all packed in here, it packed up really nicely. It was like just the perfect size. Um, your thing doesn't have to be as big as this, but um, it needs to be big enough, obviously, to hold all the meat that, that you're going to, to cure. All right, so there are two fundamental methods to kicking off the curing process and for a number of reasons this is the one that I prefer um, so I'm going to show you how to do that when we get to the part where we're talking about spices and, and everything I will talk to you then about the other option and how other people do it and uh, you can, can decide yourself if you feel you want to do it that way but this is the way I do it and what it boils down to is instead of having salt in the spices that then sit on the meat forever um, we salt it like on the, almost like on the ships in the old days we basically pack it in salt and kick, kick the, the curing process off and we have it in for normally we used to have it in for about an hour now we've now that we eat more salt since we keto um, I leave it in for about two hours now and that seems to be just the right level of saltiness for Pam and I. Um, but you can do it for anything from an hour to 12 hours if you want, if you really like it really, really, really salty. Um, so it really, it's, it's about how long you leave it in there and what happens is that it draws off the, the fluids from the meat, some of the fluids from the meat. Um, and that is one of the reasons that salt is that was, was used back in the day as, as a preservative and it's still used today because um, it draws the moisture away from the cells including any bacteria or any other cells that may be on the surface of the meat and as, that lo as they lose their um, fluid they are not, are not, not able to function and so they, be, they basically it renders them inactive and it renders them incapable of doing their evil deeds. Um, so I, one of the reasons I like to do it like this is because this way pretty much all the meat gets exposed to the salt to start with so that any surface uh, spores, or mold spores, bacteria that cause um, meat to spoil, any of those things you're basically negating that um, completely. So um, it's a little bit more weight, well it's actually quite a lot more wasteful uh, in terms of the, of the salt, but this uh, this rock salt is cheaper than your regular kosher salt or any other kind of salt that you buy. And I also bought a bunch of these things on, on special, I found a case of eight boxes of them for like really cheap, so I went and bought them. Pam was horrified. <laughs> but, but they fit under my, under my bookshelf in my office and so uh, no harm, no foul. Alright, so let's get started with that. So what you do is you take this bowl that you're going to use for, uh, to start your curing process and you basically cover the bottom of it in the salt. So take your meat and you start with the thickest pieces first and you pack it on top of this layer of salt. For these little pieces. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. This goes in there. Um, a piece can go in there. Okay, so pretty much once it's once that layer is packed, um, this one. Okay, so that 
Okay. Pour another layer of salt on top of this. It. So I can see, I think this is definitely um, about two thirds of what I used to make. How many pounds of meat was that? About five and a half and six and a half, so about almost 12 pounds. Okay, so that's that part done. What we do, put the lid on, and you think back in the days when they first invented this, long before refrigeration and stuff, they, uh, they probably would have left it out, but then more people died of disease <laughs> back in those days. So um, I have seen recipes where they say just leave it to sit, but I prefer to put it in the fridge for that time. So um, I'm going to do that. Okay, so I'm going to put this right here. Um, rinse this off for now. So now it's two o'clock, right? So at four o'clock, um, we're going to take it out and Put the spices on, right? So um, let's go back to the spices. The, the the basics are coriander and pepper. All right. Um, a lot of recipes talk about doing it half and half, and that's actually what I did the last time. But I felt a little like it was a bit heavy on the pepper. Um, Two hours with the, with the salt was, was actually perfect. Just maybe a little heavy on the pepper. So what I'm doing with going with here is one third. So it's two ounces of coriander seeds and one ounce of pepper. So um, one third. So one of the things that the, I talked about the other um, the other method of doing this. Is that people don't um, put it in in a bed of salt and, and let it sit uh, for a couple of hours. What they do is they mix some salt, like kosher salt or something coarse salt, into their spice mix, and um, and then they put it on. It sits overnight in the fridge for twelve hours, and then when they when it comes out of the fridge the next day, you're ready to hang. There's this, you'll see when we get this thing out of here, there's a whole bar of juices at the bottom of the, t of the tub. All right, so now, if you haven't done this, this step first, now you've come, you've got all your spices and everything on your meat ready to go. Um, it's absorbed all the flavors over the night, but now it's sitting in this bath of juices. And now you've got to take it out and try and pat it dry and um, it doesn't get out nearly as many of the juices as this method does. So what happens is when you when you hang it, it's still wet. It's still the, the meat itself has has more fluid in it still, and so it drips a lot more. And you know, do you care? I care. Um, one of the things that um, that it does do is 
especially with the pepper um, and the vinegar and everything, it doesn't attract flies. But the juices that drip out of the meat, I've seen before where there's, there's this rack of biltong and there's no flies on the biltong, but there's flies on the, on the tray at the bottom where the, where the stuff is dripped. Um, so it's just messier and it's more to clean up. It's, it's hanging in my office, so I would just rather that it didn't drip. Um, one of the other reasons I mentioned is because you, you want, um, you're using the salt as a, as a preservative to neutralize any of these potential bugs and that there's millions of spores and bugs in, that in, the, in, in this room right now. And so it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to settle on that. Some of, something's going to settle on that meat, in the surface of that meat. And you want to neutralize that so that it doesn't um, lead to numerous problems. And um, one of the big things is the bacteria and that, that I forget the name of it now, but a couple of different ones in fact, but bacteria that cause um, the food to spoil. In other words, it, it causes it to rot. And you want to make sure that you've neutralized any of those bugs so that you don't lose any of your built on and it doesn't go, um, it doesn't go off and you have to throw it away because that's like the worst sin ever. Um, just maybe an, a, um, one of the differences here, I, didn't, I thought of talking about it in the beginning and then forgot, but the big differences between biltong and jerky is, at least from all the recipes and ex ex explanations and everything that I've been able to find, most of the time jerky they don't use vinegar um, and they marinate it in, in soy sauce, which in our community is, is a big no-no anyway. And they use, they use that, they don't even put salt on it, they use that s the salt in the soy sauce to, while it's marinating overnight to draw some of the fluids off the, off the meat and, and kick off that the curing process. Um, but then it tastes like soy sauce. And, and then they cut it really, really thin. And in fact, in the commercial ones, um, they actually, like there's a quality control where they actually measure it with, with, with vernier calipers. And it needs to be between two and three millimeters thick. Otherwise, it, it, they, they throw it away. Um, so you've got this really thin stuff. And when you see these examples of how to make it yourself, it says, you know, put it in this dehydrator, so it's cooking. First of all, it's not curing, it's cooking. It's low temperature, 125 degrees, sometimes to 170. But, and then you're drying it, artificially drying it out really fast. And they said, you'll know it's ready when it looks like a piece of shoe leather. And it's like, yeah, but it is a piece of shoe leather. Um, oh, but you can have all of these flavors and put all these spices on that. You're just adding spices to shoe leather, in my opinion. Um, so, it's not properly cured. If I think back to how it originally started, um, or naturally cured, if I think back to the way it originally started, probably like Biltong did in, back in Southern Africa, um, they probably, they didn't have refrigeration then, they didn't have preservatives, because all the commercial stuff now has some form of, of artificial preservatives in it. They didn't have that stuff, and my, I believe that they probably um, had a very similar process to, to the one I'm describing to you, to you here for built up. It was cut much thicker um, and then they, it cured outside and I don't think that, I think that the, the fur trackers, the South African uh, uh, pioneers that, that ventured inland and that, that's how they, that's why they came up with this. Was to, get meat that they could take with them and it wouldn't spoil while, while they were traveling for months sometimes uh, inland. And it, it would be a similar thing for the native people here and in, and in Mexico and all the other places where ideas of jerky seem to come up. And it seems like they didn't come across vinegar. And one of the main reasons for, for using vinegar, apart from the fact that it kills any um, uh, mold spores dead in the water, um, which is 
that's what can be a big problem with, with your uh, filter if you don't do it right. Um, but it also provides an, an acidic environment where botulism it has, has no effect. Okay, I, I don't want to go into too much about it, but basically the botulism virus forms a hard, when it's exposed to oxygen, it forms a hard coating that forms a spore and it can last literally thousands of years. And they're everywhere and you can you're ingesting them all the time and the botulism spore itself is not toxic at all but what happens is that if it gets into a, a anaerobic environment and in an environment where there's no oxygen and it's warm and moist it will germinate and as it germinates it produces this toxin um, and that toxin is very 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 dangerous um, if you recover from it it can take anything from weeks to months and many people don't recover from it so it's most of the time it comes from it was found 70 percent of the cases reported are what they call infant infant intestinal botulism or something um, and apparently a kid's a baby's intestinal tract is not acidic enough in the first year of its life to, to prevent these botulism spores from germinating. And so in that time, they're very vulnerable. And that's one of the reasons that they, that they advise parents not to feed honey to their children when they're less than a year old. Um, because apparently the bees carry these spores around and they infuse them into the honey that they're making. I believe that honey is the most concentrated um, in, occurrence of botulism spores of, of anything around and that's why you're not supposed to give your kids honey when, when before it's one year old um, so when we're hanging this meat up to dry it's got air flowing around it it's not exposed it's not anaerobic it, there's oxygen everywhere but what does happen is that the meat starts to shrink as it as it dries out and some maybe in between one of those um, one of those gaps between the, the, the um, fibers of, of the muscle as it, as it shrinks and they get tightened together you may trap a spore in there that um, that is now in an, an anaerobic environment where, and then it may produce this toxin and it's very very unlikely but as far as I'm concerned, very, very unlikely is not 0% chance. And so I would much prefer to, to do this this way and make sure that we use vinegar so that we, we eliminate any possible way that, that um, some botulism uh, spore might germinate and produce this toxin. And on top of that, combined with the salt and the, the effect that the salt has, it also kills off a lot of the, um, especially the um, mold spores. And uh, that's always a good thing not to have mold on your on. Okay, so enough about that. For the basics, right? So we were talking about salt. So if you're gonna use that method where, where you're gonna put salt, you're not gonna do the, the bed of salt method, you're going to Put your salt into the spice mix. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then the recommendations I've seen most often is about one third. So if you've got two ounces of other spices, then you want about one ounce of uh, coarse salt, kosher salt. And um, again, I find that I've tasted some bilting that's been made that way. I've never made it that way, and I find it too salty. Um, but that doesn't what all that means is that maybe if I made it myself and I put less than one third salt, it wouldn't be too salty. But then there would be a whole lot less salt in this mix. So less of the meat is covered by the salt. It's not drawing out, there's less salt, so it's not drawing out as much fluid before you kickstart this whole um, or drawing out this fluid in order to kickstart this process. And so um, you can do it if you want. And there's lots of recipes. If you look up built-on recipes on, online, there's tons of recipes. And 
you, you're welcome to, to try them, but I prefer not to. Okay, so that's the kosher salt thing out of the way. All right, so now, when I first, when I was, I told you I made this years ago, all the time, and I made another 50% more than, than I've, I've made right here. And what I used to do was get coriander in a, um, in a grinder and pepper, we were still eating black pepper in those days, but black pepper in a grinder. And then on each piece of meat, I would like grind all this stuff onto the meat. And my wrist was like, I had a tennis elbow by the time I, I was finished with it. So I don't know why I never thought of it before, but I, just recently when I was kind of reading up again on trying to get up to speed again with, with how all of this stuff works, I saw uh, someone recommend that you actually grind your own spices in the pestle and mortar. I didn't even think about it. So I'm going to do it like this. One of the things you need to do with the coriander seeds is roast them gently beforehand. And that releases some of the oils and the aromas and especially then once you start crushing it, the whole kitchen and the house just smells incredible. So um, I'm going to put this in on the stove for now. Okay, let that start warming up and while I'm doing that, I'm going to start grinding the white pepper seeds. And I suppose anybody can do it any way they want, but what I found the last time I did it was that I put, I dumped the whole one ounce in there and I try to grind it and you get this mush of ground seeds, but there's all these ones that you don't get to, but they're like sitting on the top and you try and grind it and they just go shoo, and they sink down into the mush, but you don't actually get to grind it against the side and, and break it down. So I found it's much quicker in the end to put small amounts in and grind them in small amounts and, and, and just keep offloading them into a fresh jar. Okay, so we're going to do that. Put a few in here. And off we go. Still some really some biggish pieces in there, but no whole seeds. Um, and you'll see later that uh, that look that's all good. So coriander is the fundamental essence of biltong. If there's no coriander, it's not biltong. Um, so let's start the grinding process here. A bit too much. This is Indian coriander as well. Last time I made it, I, um, I used, I thought, I didn't. No, there was any difference, but there apparently are two different kinds. There's Indian, and then there's European, or sometimes called Moroccan. And that's much smaller seeds, much more dense, um, kind of smelled really good and made great built on, but um, these are bigger seeds and they seem to grind much easier, which is um, a good thing. Still have quite a bit of kernels, I guess you could call them, right? Just so people know what yeah. texture they're looking for. Sure, you don't, you, don't, you don't want to grind it into complete powder. Um, you can, if you want, and if you do, um, just understand that you should probably use less spices on your, on your meat because it all then gets 
uh, trap in, in those um, muscle fibers I was telling you as they contract. You'll see I'll show them at the end once it's finished curing. Um, you can see the amount that some of the spices are actually trapped in there. So if, you, if it's all powder, it's all going to get trapped in there. So it's going to be much, it's not then absorbing the flavors and the aromas, it's actually trapping the spice itself. And some of it is good, but too much of it's not, well, and depending on your taste, you might like it like that, and that's cool. But uh, we'll have to play with that and find out what's, what's the right ratio. The same as using white pepper powder and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. 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 Plus, I think the thing with this is that the, the freshly ground uh, thing is there's just so much more flavor and so much more aroma to it than, um, than if it's some jar of powdered white peppercorns that's been sitting in the cupboard forever. Okay, that's all the spices ground up. So what I like to do is put it in a, I found one of these things, an old spice bottle. It's got a nice, uh, nice sprinkling mechanism and uh, seems to work really well for, for these spices. And I'll show you why it's such a cool idea to, to put it in something like that when you're applying it when I actually do it. Um, one of the other things that I, we can talk about right now is um, these are the basic spices, but you can introduce anything else that you like that you feel would make it taste perfect for you. Um, chili spices, uh, chili flakes, uh, garlic powder, onion powder, um, uh, sage, anything, anything you want, anything that you feel would provide the flavor and, the, and that that would just you to, to die for, that you would die for. Um, so, one of the things that I often put on a portion of the stuff that I make is this peri peri powder, and um, it's a very common and, and used in many, many, many things in South Africa. And um, it's a, as far as I know, it's like a Portuguese chili spice. Um, it's got an amazing flavor, which is, I find, like compared to habanero chilies or something like I really like quite spicy stuff. And habaneros are, are good because they've still got good flavor. Um, but the peri peri chilies, I feel, are, have like another order of magnitude in terms of um, flavor and so this is my preferred go-to spicy spice and um, but you can use anything you like all right so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on s a few pieces of the meat and um, hang it separately Pam's not hugely fond of, of spicy stuff so I need to keep it separated and know which ones are which. So I normally put it on, say, the smaller pieces or something so that I know, okay, all those smaller pieces have very, very on them. Um, what I'm going to do is this, this little bowl here is the spices that I had left from last time. And um, as much as we would love to have freshly ground spices on every, every batch that we make, um, I'm not in a position yet to throw this away and keep buying new stuff every time we go. We get better at, at judging how much we need for the amount of meat that, we've, that we try to prepare. Um, and so hopefully over time, you'll have less and less left over. But you also don't ever want to run out. Like you're halfway through, you've got one and a half pieces of stuff, meat left and you run out of spices. That also sucks. So what I'm going to do, since this is a lot of flavor and adds a lot more to the uh, texture of the whole thing. I'm going to add this to what's left over here. And so use this now on those extra pieces of meat and then use the freshly ground spices on all the other meat. Um, and that way we still get use out of the, the leftover ones from last time without wasting it. Okay, so um, 
just judging, eyeballing this, you know, we could probably use all of this stuff that's in this bottle. And it's pretty, pretty strong. If you're, gonna, if you're trying this or whatever, just be careful because it, it's, it's pretty hard. Alrighty. So now, put it into my sprinkle bottle and my trusty homemade funnel again. consistent spread of the spices over the meat once you started to treat it. Okay, so that's ready to go. Um, right, I'm just waiting for the meat. Almost exactly an hour to go, so we'll be back here in an hour. So, now. so I'm a bit of a turkey and I forgot to switch on the external mic when we started recording this session. So you're going to have to live with a voiceover for this session or for this bit of it. When I'm, I just, we just retrieved that uh, box of meat from the fridge after two hours. And I was just showing you how much fluid had, had been drawn off the meat already in just those two hours. Um, the, the thing we need to do now is get this salt off the meat. And there are a few different methods that have been advocated in different uh, in different recipes. One, one is to run the different slabs of meat under the tap, under the faucet, uh, running cold water. Um, but my feeling is that you wash, although that some a bunch of salt has actually been absorbed into the meat, if you wash it like that, you actually wash the salt off the surface of the meat and you need that for the preservative benefits that uh, we've talked about earlier, about the, the whole reason for using salt. So I prefer not to do that one. One of the other ones is to scrape the meat with the back of the knife. And I don't feel like you really get, um, you get it all off that way. And the best, best way I've come across in the end is to actually just do it with my fingers. That way you can actually feel the, the salt granules on the meat and you can feel when you've got all of it off. And, um, but, at the, but you haven't washed the saltiness off the surface of the meat, which is, that, as I mentioned, the you know, for the preservative benefits that, uh, that that has. So basically, I just run through each piece of meat like this, get all the salt off, and then set it aside in a tray. You'll notice that uh, the meat is probably a bit thinner now than it was uh, when, when you first put it in there because some of the water has been drawn off. And you'll notice also that it's, it's uh, fairly rigid. It's, it's not all floppy like it, like it was um, when we first put it in. And that again is because um, the fluid's been drawn off and it's actually started to dry out a little bit. So as we come to the last piece of meat here, we'll see again how much fluid is actually drawn off that meat in those two hours. And we need to dump that out and clean the container out because uh, we're going to need it again shortly. So now we have a pile of meat here with all the external salt removed. And the next step is to apply the vinegar. Now, I've seen a few recipes that talk about applying the vinegar using a basting brush or a spray bottle and not to dip it. And the reason for that is that the main reason that we're using the vinegar is for the effects that it can have in, in preventing um, botulism and, and, um, and mold. Now, if you, what, what I found out is that salt actually neutralizes some of the acidity in the vinegar. So there's still a little bit of salt on these pieces of meat. So if you keep, have a little um, bowl of vinegar that you're dipping all these pieces of meat into, one by one, or slowly but surely, the acidity in the vinegar in that bowl is going to get reduced. 
And at some point, it's going to fall below that threshold level where it's no longer effective in neutralizing these spurs. So um, that's the reason why you need to apply it using a basting brush or uh, with a spray bottle, which is the, the method that I prefer to use. So we're talking about the vinegar here, and I use plain white vinegar. Now, there are recipes that talk about it has to be apple cider vinegar or um, uh, red wine vinegar or whatever type of vinegar. And I feel like some of these recipes actually call for the meat to actually be marinated in a, the vinegar solution. And you lit literally leave it overnight in, lying in this vinegar. And what happens is that the meat acquires that vinegar taste, a bit like uh, salt and vinegar chips, you know, and um, it's that tangy vinegar flavor. And if that's the case, um, then the flavor of the vinegar will, will definitely make a difference. And whether it's apple cider or balsamic or red wine vinegar, you're going to maybe taste those flavors in the meat with that tangy vinegar flavor. Now, I personally don't I prefer that not to have that flavor and the main reason I'm using the vinegar is just for its preservative value so you work your way through each piece of meat here spraying the vinegar onto it making sure that you get it onto all the different surfaces and then put that piece aside and grab the next one until you've worked through every piece of meat. It's lucky that I ran out of vinegar at this point because I was on a roll and I had totally forgotten that I wanted to try something of a bit of a variety for a few pieces to see, to see the difference. Now, there's a lot of um, Biltong recipes that you'll come across that call for Worcestershire sauce or Worcestershire sauce as we call it uh, mixed in with the vinegar. And I, that's how I used to make it back in the day. Um, but this last batch I made, I didn't use it. and. I can't say that I really noticed a difference, but it's five years since I had the last piece of building that I made with Worcester sauce. So, um, you know, the brain can forget these things. So what I decided to do here is make a couple of pieces with Worcester sauce applied, and then I can try them literally side by side and see whether or not it's worth um, continuing to include Worcester sauce in, in my recipe. Because there is a very small amount of sugar added and, you know, with, with, with us, with keto especially, we're trying to eliminate as much added sugar as possible, completely if possible. So even though it's a very small amount, if I can rather do without it, I would. But if it's going to make a huge difference to the flavor, then um, I'll, I'll live with a, a couple of grams of added sugar in the solution that's, that's being used for a number of pounds of meat. So... It's really very little added sugar. So what I'm doing here is adding about two tablespoons of Worcester sauce to the vinegar solution, which I will then use on the remainder of the pieces. So next we come to applying the spices. Now, if you're a vegan, you're out of luck here in experiencing how absolutely amazing this stuff tastes. Uh, maybe one day they'll come up with a chemical concoction called uh, Beyond Biltong or something. But um, if you're a hardcore carnivore, you might be out of luck as well. Because my understanding that there, in some very hardcore carnivores, they don't even use spices at all because, you know, they're plants. So um, what I've decided to do here is put... A piece aside now that it's been through the salting process and not apply any of the spices to it and um, it's not going to have to lie in the spices overnight so I'll probably hang that piece up tonight and um, and then we can see what it tastes like and see if there's a, if there really is something that we can do for the carnivores I think the the meat flavor with the salt and everything I think is still going to be pretty outstanding but I've never tried it so um, I'm trying it now, and we'll uh, we'll report back later and see and see how it goes. 
Now to apply the spices, you could just have the mixed spices in a bowl and take pinches of it and, and sprinkle it over the meat. But I find it uh, a lot more convenient and a lot easier to, uh, to use the spice bottle as a sprinkler that the way that I showed you a bit earlier. So basically you need to just take the, the spices, sprinkle it over the meat and then spread it out with your, with your fingers of the other hand and then pat it into the meat. And that, so that's called the wet hand, dry hand method. So with the one hand you keep grabbing the meat and um, spreading and, and patting in the spices and the other hand remains dry and either um, applies the spices via pinching it from, uh, from a bowl or sprinkling it on with the bottle like I'm showing you here. And then once you've done that, you pile it into the container so that uh, it can sit in there and uh, marinate overnight. Um, remember that this bottle that I'm sprinkling with now has some peri-peri powder in it as well. So we'll keep using that until it's finished and keep piling that in the one end of the box and then the rest of the stuff we'll pile in the other end of the box to make sure that uh, we keep them separated and we remember what's what the next day. So now we're adding the, all the freshly ground spices to the bottle, the sprinkle bottle, um, to apply to the rest of the meat. Make sure we rinse the peri-peri powder off the sprinkle tray that we're using so we don't get contamination of the non-peri-peri batch. So now we have all the meat spiced. Um, I've left the ones that we put the Worcester sauce on uh, in the tray so that uh, we can keep them separate from the regular stuff and the peri-peri stuff that's already separated in, in the container. Um, so we'll just cover that with saran wrap and leave it in the fridge overnight. So we just put the lid back on the container, cover the other one with saran wrap and put it in the fridge for 12 hours and um, we'll see you tomorrow morning and uh, in the hanging room and we'll show you how to hang it. We're going to take that one piece that's still in the glass jar that is, uh, is there for the carnivore test. We'll probably go and hang that um, right away. And the rest of it will sit in the fridge overnight and we'll hang that in the morning. Okay, so it's the next day, and uh, we're going to show you how to hang the belt on. Um, the area that I have set up to, to do it in our house is actually in my office. So you can see here is my, uh, my workstation, and if you swing around here, then this is where I've cleared the space to hang it on a set of shelves I've got behind me in my office. All right, so I've got the box of the meat that was packed and you saw me packing yesterday and put in the fridge overnight to draw in all the flavors from the spices. And this is the setup with my, uh, with my shelving here. So basically I've cleared this shelf. I took a big cardboard box and flattened it out and made a floor for this so that you don't get some random spices and that dropping through into the stuff in the shelves below. And then that's kind of a permanent floor. And each time I do another batch, I basically cover it with a fresh set of uh, um, paper towels just to catch the odd drip 
that might come down and some of the, the uh, spices that, that fall off as it starts to cure. All right, I've got a the flat bowl down here with my hooks lying in a bath of vinegar, which um, I normally do overnight. What I use is um, just basic paper clips. And I've got the, the final ones, mainly to try and prevent issues with the metal ones rusting. So the vinyl ones are very cool. I can use them every time, basically just bend it open. I use the, the bigger piece to skewer through the meat and this little uh, hook at the, on the other end, the smaller piece, hooks really nicely onto these uh, slats on the shelves. If you have rails or something that you hang your biltong on, then um, you can either bend this open a bit more to fit onto the rail or maybe find yourself some, uh, some other kind of hook. If you're going to use metal hooks, please make sure that they are proper stainless steel so that you don't have issues with rust. And um, I think these days, most likely you'll be able to get probably really cheap some kind of vinyl plastic type um, S-shaped hook. That'll work great. Okay, so what we do is go and we take this meat, this meat. And what I normally do is, you see the meat, okay, and hang it with the thickest piece at the top and the thinner piece down at the bottom. And there's reasons for that, which you will learn about over the next couple of days. And then skewer this through probably three quarters of an inch down into the meat. Enough down so that it, it, uh, it can support it. Because what happens is that it, it starts to pull out and form this funny U-shaped thing if you, if you hook it in right close to the edge of the meat. Okay, so you take this, I start with the thicker pieces first and put those at the back of the shell because those are the ones that are going to cure, take the longest to cure. So the ones that are, we are going to get ready first are then going to be set up near, closer to the front of the thing. So we put that on there, like that, and you just process through all your meat and hang it up. Okay, so there it is, all hung up. Um, the regular stuff is here. There's a bit of a gap in the peri-peri stuff that I made is here. The terry few that I've used with um, the Worcester sauce are hanging here. And lurking in the back there is the uh, the one that I hang up that I hung up yesterday, um, but doesn't have any spices on, as a tryout to see how we can cater to our hardcore carnival people. Okay, so the next thing to do is to get some airflow over this thing. So I've got a fan set up here. Put this on. Oxidate. Okay, and so, so basically here is the fan. And it sits there, it's on the lowest setting, and it blows gently over the meat as it cures. Keep the airflow. It's really important to uh, to have an airflow over it so that you uh, eliminate any chances of, of um, developing any mold on the, on the meat. Um, with all the salting that we've done and the, and the fact that we've used vinegar and all of that, it's also unlikely that we're going to get that mold, but this is an added precaution to make sure that that's the case. Now, this will work, in this sort of situation, this kind of setup will work for most people, but if you're in a very humid environment um, and or if you have a lot of bugs that uh, and flies and stuff that may be able to get into the, the house or into the area where you're going to be curing your meat then it might be a good idea to use something like a built-on box um, if you look up built-on box on on Google you'll find tons of different ideas about how to do it um, two real main different ones one is with a with an extractor fan, and you like a little computer fan or something that they, they mount on the top of the box. Have a, a bunch of uh, ventilation holes at the bottom, and the fan draws the air through the box and across the meat. Just make sure that the fan has a really low setting 
so that it, you've got a gentle movement air movement over the, the meat and not like a mini hurricane going on inside the box. Um, if that if that happens here or anywhere else, if, if there's too much, if, if they've got a strong fan blowing on it, there's too much air movement over it, um, you'll find that the, the outside of the meat, the casing will become really hard. And um, that's not ideal. It's uh, what, apart from the fact that it makes it a little tougher to eat, it also can, the case can get tough enough that it doesn't allow any more moisture out from the inside and so the inside part of the meat then doesn't dry out and doesn't cure properly. So you don't want that going on. Um, the other way is to um, is to have a little light bulb at the bottom of the box. Now what they, what they normally do, in most of the ones that I've seen, they have a floor just above the uh, above the light bulb and then they hang the the meat in there they've got holes through the, the through this floor and they've got ventilation holes at the top of the box and basically the, the light bulb heats up the air and it flows up through the ventilation holes in the floor and out through the top and that way you get that airflow generated one of the nice things about that is if you're in a really really humid place and you don't are not able to run a dehumidifier in the room or you don't or can't run the aircon to dry the air out um, and this is the only way this heating of the air inside the box will dry it out so that you won't have issues with the meat molding or spoiling because it's too humid. Um, that being said, that's kind of like a last, resor last resort. You don't want to be heating or artificially drying this meat in any way. You need it to cure as slowly and as naturally as possible um, in order to retain the best flavors and the best quality of the meat and the most nutrients at the end of the day. Um, so this is it, I mean, totally natural. It's no preservatives, perfect uh, snack, perfect meal even, um, especially if you're on keto, that's the best thing. You can take it with you wherever you go. Uh, you know, you cut a few slices and put it in a little baggie, put it in your pocket. And, but you know, four ounces of this Biltong is like an eight ounce steak. You put four ounces of a few slices in your pocket and you go somewhere and they don't have food that you are able to or want to eat at the, wherever you're going. You can just dip in your pocket and snack on a few of these things and you've had an eight ounce steak by the end of it. That's a meal for most people. Not for Sean Baker, but um, for most of us, eight ounce steak is, is, is good for a meal. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna come back tomorrow and see how this is going. See, you'll see then already how it started to cure. See the process, some of the really thin pieces that I've hung up here may even be ready already. Um, but the thicker pieces, worst case, uh, by the end of the third day, they'll, they'll be ready to, ready to take down. And we can go back to the kitchen and I can slice them up and show you what it looks like inside and uh, we can try it. All right, so we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, so it's about 24 hours now since uh, since we hung this biltong up and first thing you'll notice here is that I moved the fan. Um, this is the first time I was actually using this fan and where it was I felt like it was blowing a little too hard across the meat and so I moved it back and it seems to be a lot better there. I'm not sure if you can see it here but um, you can see as the fan drifts past it, you can see it wiggle just very slightly as the, as the air passes over it, but it's not like rocking backwards and forwards violently. So I feel like it's probably a good distance, a good uh, airflow now where it is. Um, notice that, I'll zoom in here so you can see, the color has changed significantly, okay? Um, where we hung it up yesterday, it's still red meat. Now it's turning a much darker, blackish color almost. And that's a good thing. That's what it needs to start looking like. Okay. Just going through there and making sure that uh, we don't see any mold. I'm almost 100% certain that 
in this situation there wouldn't be but that doesn't mean we shouldn't check anyway um, so now we start to look at how the meat's curing because you remember when we cut it up that there were edge pieces and slices that were weren't as thick as others and so what's going to happen with that is that they will cure quicker and so we need to keep an eye on that and make sure that we take the thinner pieces down in time so that they don't dry out too much um, let's start with this piece here this is a really thin edge piece you see it like this it's almost as thin as jerky it's so thin okay but that's no reason to let it go to waste um, this piece in fact is is really is ready to take down um, you'll notice the way that you can tell first of all make sure you wash your hands before you do this as with when you were preparing it you need to wash all the surfaces all the equipment and your hands before you start managing the meat same thing every time you want to check it just make sure that you that you wash your hands and and then when you feel it like this big thick piece here is still really soft but um, what I've noticed is that it actually feels cool like dampish it's like a da yes it's like a damp feeling and what, what's happening there is that the, the, the moisture is wicking out of the meat and evaporating off the surface of the meat and that's actually having a cooling effect and so it actually feels a little cooler like this this little piece that's ready now that's not happening anymore and it's actually not cool to the touch like like these other thicker pieces are you'll also notice that um, I mentioned there was method in my madness by hanging it thicker side up and the reason for that is that the, the thinner pieces are going to cure faster and so there's going to be a time with some of them where there, there is a, a big difference in the thickness from top to bottom that you'll probably want to cut a piece of that away um, because it's ready it's cured whereas the, the, the thicker piece above it is still not ready so instead of waiting for the thicker piece to get ready and then having the thinner part of it actually dry out too much and over cure um, you rather cut it away put it in the fridge with in your ziploc bag with with the rest of the of the built on that you as, as you take it down and and that way you, you prevent um, over curing pieces of it all right so I think maybe you can see with this one this is probably a good example here that if you if you see from about here down okay from about here down um, it's actually thinner than up here so when I, if I if I pinch on this like right at the bottom where it's really thin it feels like it, it might be ready but probably what I'll do is wait until it feels ready about here and then cut it off here and then this thicker piece here will probably take another day and then it'll be ready to take down okay so yeah all right okay and then with with some of them like this piece here you can see this piece is pretty much consistently thick all the way down and there's a tiny little thin strip here that's really thin to the touch this still feels like it's not ready but maybe by this evening it will be and then we'll cut that little piece off and I can probably tell you for free that that's not going to make it back to the fridge but um, at least we cut that piece off before it's over dried all right so I'm going to go through here and cut a couple of little pieces off I brought a little um, cutting board that I put up here that's always pretty useful ah trusty pen knife okay so Here's a piece where the um, where this little tip part is is ready. So I'm gonna cut that off. Hang the rest of it back up. And there we've got a little piece that's ready to snack on. Mm -mm -mm. 
Alrighty, so I'm going to go through, cut the, some of the tips off that are ready, and um, and we'll come back tomorrow and, and uh, see which pieces, by that stage, I'm pretty sure there will at least be a few pieces that will be ready to take down. And then on day three, once I've taken the good thick pieces down, we can go back to the kitchen and I can cut through the different pieces and show you what it should look like and um, the different options that you've got in, in terms of how long you cure it for. Alrighty, so we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, so here we are three days into it. It's three days since we, we hung it up. And you'll notice that uh, some of the smaller pieces have already been taken down. And uh, you'll see some of the thinner pieces at the ends of some of these bigger pieces here have been cut off. One of the things um, I should have mentioned, which I haven't shown, is if you do end up cutting a piece off here, get this out. So if you if you snip a piece off at the bottom there where it's really thin and you want a bit of a taster or whatever, um, if you do that, it would be a good thing to go and um, wet a, a paper towel or something with some vinegar and just wipe the exposed area on there so that you make sure that. Um, you prevent any potential mold or whatever from from forming on that exposed bit. Um, again, every day we've been checking for mold. If you've done this right, there should be no reason that you would get any molding going on, but it's always good to check anyway. And so now I'm just going to, to check for these things. It's a, it's a bit of an art, right? So you, you need it, you'll, remember I mentioned that it, it feels damp and, and a bit um, uh, and coolish uh, when, it's, when it's still evaporating and curing. Um, so by the time it's, re it's going to be ready, you, you shouldn't feel that damp type feeling anymore. But you'll still feel that it's, that it's a bit squishy. It needs to be a bit squishy so that it, you know that it's still soft inside. And exactly at what point you take it off is the secret, right? It depends on how you like it. Some people prefer it to be done all the way through. Um, and therefore, it would be very little give when you, when you s squeeze it together like that. Some people like it pretty red inside, like someone likes their, their steaks really rare. Um, and so that'll be more squishy than not. What you're going to have to develop that feel. Basically, know that when you feel that amount of squishiness, that's for you the right time to take it off. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of these. I did swear blind that it would they would all be done in three days, but we've had more rain here in the last few days than I've had in all 20 years I've been in San Diego, and there's actually been a lot more humid than it normally is here and so I feel like there are a few pieces here the thicker ones that um, may well have to stay hanging overnight and come off tomorrow morning but there are a bunch of them that are ready now so I'm going to take them down so feeling this this one is definitely ready to go Probably stay. That's ready. Huh. Well, that one can hang a bit okay. still. Alright, so almost all the peri peri stuff is ready. This was the one extra piece that I did with uh, with Worcester sauce. You can see the see the nice piece of fat down the side there. Um, so that's the Worcester sauce piece. Ones. That's ready. So most of it's come down. There's a handful of pieces there that are, are going to stay probably overnight and I'll take them down tomorrow morning. Um, one of the things I don't remember if I mentioned it to you, but when you are hanging these pieces, make, you need to make sure that they are not touching each other because that um, could lead to some kind of mold or spoiling issues 
if, uh, if they do end up touching each other. So just make sure that they, they all clear each other while they're hanging. Okay, so um, let's uh, take these, this tray through to the kitchen and um, we can cut some up and I can, we can try it. Okay, so we're here in the kitchen now with, uh, with all the built on that we've just taken down. Um, pretty much four different varieties that we've got here. We've got uh, this one that uh, I actually took down yesterday already, which was the, the one big piece that we kept um, with no spices on it. Uh, just, just check out how the hardcore carnivores who don't have or allow any spices at all into their diet, um, whether they would be able to do something just uh, with the meat salted. So um, maybe let's cut a couple of slices of this. And what I normally like to do is, is cut it into a slice about that thin. And you'll notice that, remember that we cut everything along the grain. So now when we slice it, we're slicing it across the grain. And now it's, uh, it's really um, tender and easy to, to bite through and tear apart. Um, and notice that uh, it's got this uh, light red tint in the middle. And um, it's a little bit, actually a bit more done than I would, no I would normally, I would prefer to have taken this off probably a few hours earlier to have it perfect um, but it's still really good and um, I'm just trying this wow it doesn't have all the flavors of the um, of the spices but it's still really really good and um, even the fire saltiness goes some people may prefer it a little less so they would leave it less than that two hours in the in the in the salt, but um, it's really good. It's uh, hope for the hardcore carnivores. They can make biltong and eat it and have no spices to mess with their with their chosen diet. Okay, so I'm going to set that aside so that we can look at the others that are here that we've just taken down. Um, so. A good piece to try now. So you'll notice that there's still a lot of those um, roughly ground spices on the outside of the meat. Now you could just cut it up like this and eat it like that, and I know I know many people that do. Um, but I'm, I'm just not into biting into a whole piece of, of uh, ground pepper or something like that. I prefer the nuances and the flavors and the aromas that, that the spices have infused into the meat combined with the actual concentrated, now that it's dehydrated, the concentrated flavors of the meat rather than actually taste biting into an actual piece of spice. Uh, that to me is, is not what this is about. So what I like to do is rub all the loose spices of the meat okay and what that does is get rid of most of it but what you will see and i mentioned this <clears throat> a little bit when i am um, when i was actually salt uh, spicing the things but you'll notice that there's still some spices in there, they're actually trapped in amongst those muscle fibers. As they've contracted, as it's dried out, um, they've got trapped in there. So there's, there's still a bunch of spices in here and you're still going to get this flavor, but um, you don't have a bunch of loose stuff. And the other thing is, um, if you leave this, the loose stuff on, when you start cutting it, you just get bits of spices all over the place and it's, it's a bit messy. So unless you're eating it with a pen knife outside or something, um, it's kind of not ideal for, for trying to eat it at home. All right, so now let's let's take a look at what this looks like. All right. And here's an example 
since this is the end piece, a bit like the end piece on a roast, right? Where you've got a, a roast that's done medium or rare even, but the end caps are, are done through. So um, this is kind of the end cap and you'll notice that it's, it's almost, almost that black color all the way through, okay? Um, if you left it up there to dry for longer, eventually that all, your, all the, the pieces are built on would look that way. Um, some people prefer it like that. Um, I think it's a bit like uh, doing steak beyond medium rare. It should be illegal. Um, but some people like their steak well done. And so, um, you know, restaurants have to prepare it like that. Um, so that if people ask for it, that's what they get. So if you want, if you want this to, to dry all the way through, it'll still be a little bit squishy, but because um, it hasn't dried out really hard yet, but it's, it's at least cured all the way through and you don't have any redness to the color. Um, I was gonna say there's no excuse whatsoever for letting the biltong dry out to a point where it's actually hard. But I take that back and there may be a, what, a reason for allowing at least a piece or two to, to go to that point. And that is if you plan to use it as a condiment, as, as on salads and stuff, there's a lot of recipes in that, especially if you're looking at recipes from South Africa, that call for grated biltong on, on the salad or on, in the dish. And so there, in that particular case, if it's harder, it's much easier to grate, to grate consistently and grate properly. So you might want to keep one or two pieces aside for grating if that's something you feel like, like you want to do. Okay, so this, this, is the, this is the regular stuff. I've kind of separated it, regular peri peri and the one with the Worcester sauce. Okay, let's try another couple of pieces here. Okay, now we've got past that end cup. Now we get into the real McCoy. This is this is what I want my built on to look like. Okay, it's got like it's like a medium rare steak. It's got this rare bit in the middle, and it's got the, the darker pieces on the uh, the darker rim around the outside. You can see the um, the intramuscular fat that's been trapped inside here. So. That's a real feature of this eye of round cut of meat that, that, that I've used here, that it has a lot of this intramuscular fat. And so it's not, a, it's the, this biltong is not really lean. It, you, uh, for those of us who still want a lot of uh, saturated fat in our diets, this is perfect. Okay. And um, I'm just going to put these in here. This is the regular one. Set aside. This is the one with Worcester sauce. Okay. You can see part of this one is actually really rare. Nice bit of fat on the end. Okay, here are some pieces with peri peri. So if you've done like I've done here and make a few different varieties, this is a good time to sit and, and actually try them out and see which ones you prefer, see, start making notes and, um, and deciding what you really like and, and started coming up with ideas of how to tweak the, the spices and that so that it's perfect for you. Okay, so I've already just tried the, the, 
the regular one. I want to try the one with Vista Source here and see. Yeah, you know, I really can't taste much of a difference, if anything at all. Quite frankly, adding Worcester sauce is just another another ingredient, another another extra thing to do. And the fact that it even has a little bit of added sugar into it, which is something that uh, we particularly are trying to eliminate as, in, as much and any added sugar as we can in, in our diets at all. I'm going to go with uh, leaving this out of my any of my recipes from now on. Um, you guys are welcome to, to keep using it if you think if you think you like it. One of the things I'm going to do next time, as I mentioned, is do some with uh, just the pure white vinegar and some with apple cider vinegar, and see if I can notice a, uh, any difference in in the taste there. Is because the, the plain white vinegar is much cheaper than the, than the uh, apple cider vinegar, so I would much rather go with that if there's no real difference. Because I don't soak mine in vinegar, so it, in order to get the vinegar taste in the meat. So I kind of feel like there won't be a difference between uh, the apple cider and the white vinegar. And, um, it, and I, that's what I seem to remember from five years ago when I used to make it. But um, I'm, I don't remember 100%, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try for myself and see how that goes. All right, so that aside, and it's just tasting very, very. Mm. That's really good. Okay, so now that we've taken all the pieces down, the last bit here is just for me to show you how to store it. So basically, this stuff now that it's cured won't spoil. And if you just left it out, it, it would never spoil, but it would continue to dry out and eventually it would be really hard, as I mentioned before, which is something you don't really want to do. The best thing to do is then keep the excess in the freezer, right? Um, simple Ziploc bags, if you can see here, I've got the Worcester sauce ones and the Peri Peri ones um, and the regular ones here now. And we just basically store that in the freezer. Squish all of the air out of it and um, and it'll stay in the freezer pretty much forever um, and won't continue to dry out. And then what we do is we keep a few pieces in, um, in the fridge and while they're in the fridge, especially if you've sucked as much air as possible out of the bags, um, they'll last a few weeks um, but will slowly continue to dry out. Um, because there is a bit of air in the bag. If, you're, if you have access to a um, vacuum sealer, then that's different. You can vacuum seal it, keep it in the fridge, and it'll pretty much, you'll, the shelf life in the fridge will be pretty much as long as the freezer. Um, but most of us don't have access to that, so whatever bag we would put it in, it's gonna have some air in it, and it will slowly dry out. So only keep a few pieces in the fridge and keep replenishing that from your store that you have in in the freezer okay one other thing if you do ever get mold on it as long as it's white mold so white mold pretty much is is edible um, in fact apparently if you look on really well cured salami that has that like white powdery stuff on the outside that's actually mold um, and we go ahead and slice that and eat it just as it is. But personally, I, I prefer not to have any mold on, on my biltong if I can help it. I have never had it on anything that I've made, but I have had it on some biltong that I've bought and it's been in a paper bag and it's still a bit wet and so it, it started to get a bit of mold on it, a bit of white mold. All you need to do is, just like I told you, if you cut the, uh, the ends off while it's still hanging, to wipe the exposed area with vinegar, um, you do the same here. Vinegar kills that mold spore straight away. So basically, you get a damp towel or a paper towel or something damp with vinegar and just wipe it, and it will kill the mold and wipe it off straight away. If you're seeing green or black 
kind of stuff, that's not good. And if you ever had to see that, and I, you may have seen that if you've left something um, in the fridge for a long time, and eventually it starts and it's growing this green stuff. <laughs> if that's ever the case, chuck it out. And if you ever see the meat's got a greenish tinge to it or something, and it doesn't smells a bit funky, and it's actually spoiled, then again, chuck it out. It's sacrilege to ever have to chuck any biltong out, but um, it's better to do that than, than eat something that's, that's rotten or that has a bunch of really uh, dangerous mold on it. So there you have it, make your own biltong. It's absolutely awesome, it tastes fantastic. There's no such thing as bad biltong, it's just much better biltong and brilliant perfect biltong but all biltong is really good and um, I've gone through a lot of stuff here it's really easy to make and it's really rewarding so um, go and get yourself set up clear a little space on a shelf somewhere get yourself you don't have to buy 15 pounds of meat like I did buy yourself one little piece of piece of roast cut it up hang a few pieces and try it out and um, I'm just, I promise you, if you do it once, you'll be doing this for the rest of your life. Thanks for listening.